Hello friends, welcome to Be Waste Wise. I am Shweta Dandapani. I'm the community builder at Be Waste Wise. And in today's webinar, we're going to discuss policy reforms in the UK. We have Robert Thompson, packaging technologist at the co-op. We have Sarah Jane Budalson, who's the director at Intellisource, and Yarno Stett, Waste and Recycling Manager at Westminster City Council. And uh, Adam Reed is a moderator of this panel. He's the Director of External Affairs at Suez Recycling and Recovery. He is also the President at CIWM. So uh, just a reminder to everyone, if you coming back for uh, one of, if you've attended one of our earlier panels, you would know that we take live questions. Please use the Q&A section to drop your questions. Adam is going to take them and in, try to ensure that all your questions are answered. So over to you, Adam. Thank you very much, Sweta. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, good something, depending on where you are in the world. I'm assuming this is a, a reasonably UK-centric audience, but we never know, do we? So um, welcome, welcome. Um, yeah, Dr. Adam Reid, External Affairs at Suez and uh, President of the CRWM, but today I'm just a, a humble facilitator letting an expert panel share their reflections on what has been a, a, a tumultuous I'd, I'd like to say six months, but it hasn't. It's been a tumultuous two years and that's got nothing to do with the pandemic. Um, we've been in consultation mode for what seems like an eternity. The first phase of the consultations, of course, dating back to, to 2020 and the second phase having completed more recently. And, and when you look at the extensive policy reform that's being proposed in the UK, which aligns very well with Europe in, in many respects, it is just the biggest step change that any of us will probably ever see in our lifetime. So it probably deserves more than an, an hour's webinar, but here we go, we're gonna give it a shot. So Sweater, can we have some slides please? And I'll, I'll do a little bit of scene setting, which is very unusual in these sessions, but we'll do a few slides from me and then we'll get the panelists reflections. Uh, and as always, please get those questions in. Um, the more questions we get, the less uh, questions I have to dream up. Now, I, I put this slide up because back in 2020, we were looking at all the reforms that were likely to happen in our sector. And, 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 and our sector is not a simple one because of course, we interface so much with producers, whether it be households or businesses, we have to work very closely with the, the environment agency on the licensing of our sites and the permitting of our sites and infrastructure. We have to work with at least five government departments when it comes to what we do and how we do it and, uh, and how we report and the data we have to capture. And, and, and yet in, in, with the launch of the resources and waste strategy at the back end of 2019 and the desire post Brexit to still be at the cutting edge of everything that Europe is doing in terms of performance and, and targets, it was obvious that almost every facet of the waste and resource management sector in the UK was going to change. Whether you're into permitting and licensing, whether you're into niche materials, whether you're into higher targets or, or just data and, and, and waste tracking. And so I always use this as a starting slide because it just says everything is gonna change and something is gonna change more than others. Next slide, please. And, and these are the big changes. So top left, we've got extended producer responsibility. So this is not a new concept. I mean, this has been around well, since the early 90s, I suppose, uh, in much of the Western world. And the idea that those that, um, those that put waste onto the market, those that produce, put packaging on the market in particular, in this case, uh, have to fund its, its full life cycle. So they will have to pay uh, for its capture, segregation, treatment, reprocessing, et cetera. And the idea here is that, you know, by modulated fees, by, by changing the tax that's put on to certain products, you'll stimulate changes in packaging design or product design. Um, you'll drive up re the recyclability of, of, of that material to make it easier to flow through a system because ultimately that will result in your, your cost burden being lower as a brand. Um, deposit return scheme, top right. This is the one that um, always uh, sparks some opinion. The idea that um, if you're of my age anyway, I used to get my pocket money as a child by taking the, um, the Corona glass bottles back to the, uh, the, the local shop and getting 5p, that's how old I am. Um, this concept is, it operates across the whole of the world, to be honest with you. Australia's got, got many systems, as has the US and, and, and Europe. But the idea of reintroducing it in the UK is one that's quite contentious because we've got one of the most comprehensive collection systems in terms of mixed recycling anywhere on the planet. So how would consumers respond to having 20p on a can of Coke or on a bottle of pop uh, or any other packaging item for that matter. And, 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 and 
where would you go to return it? I think was one of the really interesting elements of, of the debate around DRS. Do you have to go back to the shop you bought it from? Is it any shop? Is it on street reverse vending machines? Huge, huge opportunity around quality material, but also a massive step change in what my mum does. And, you know, let's be honest, my mum is kind of a good benchmark for what does the average person in the UK do. So then bottom left, we've got the plastic tax. It's the first one of these policy drivers that's, gonna, that's actually going to come into force because it comes into force in, in 2022. Um, the idea here is that there will be a tax of £200 for every tonne um, of, uh, for every tonne that your uh, packaging, plastic packaging, is over a 30% threshold. So if you've got 30% recycled content, you're okay. If you've got 29% recycled content, you're not. And therefore that tonnage will be taxed at 200 pound per ton. The idea is that that will pull more material through the market. It will create a pricing differentiation. It will ensure that there is recycled content in things that don't currently have high recycled content. And over time, we expect both the target to go from 30% to 40% to 50%, just like the landfill tax did. But we also expect the tax to rise a bit like landfill tax. So it'll go up from 200 pounds a ton to 300 pounds a ton. Who knows where it may end up in Europe. We're currently looking at maybe 500 pounds a ton for some of the taxation around plastics. So that one comes into force next year. EPR and DRS are proposed for 2024, 25, still to be confirmed. That's one of the interesting things about the uncertainty of these consultations. And bottom right is the one that I like most because I am just a, you know, I'm just a hard, hard core recycler, consistent collections. The idea that the same material streams will be collected from every house, wherever they are, and every business, wherever they are in the UK. And that way, we can get consistent messaging to the public and to businesses. We can get consistent labelling um, to ensure that uh, everybody knows what should be recycled and how to recycle. And in theory, it should ensure that we get better quality of material, because ultimately, when, um, when those residents decide that they'd like to recycle or could I recycle, I'm not sure, that kind of uncertainty starts to disappear over time. So lots of policy reform. I mean, we're talking, I can't remember now, it's over 1,500 pages of consultation documents in the last six months. I mean, unbelievable detail and impact assessments that we've been wading through and we'll, we'll get the panelists' opinion. But um, I've just dropped uh, uh, two pointers on here. One is how synchronized are the systems? And that's my question for the panel in a moment. Do these four policy interventions actually work together or are we still concerned? And two, the bottom line there, I've added the English Waste Prevention Plan. I know it's only England, and I apologise for being parochial to those of you in Wales, Scotland, Northern Ireland, but we, we launched that recently. It was an update. Uh, it had been some, some six or seven years since the last one. And actually, it's the most disappointing government consultation document I've read in a long time because it said absolutely nothing that was new. It didn't commit to anything significant. And more importantly, I don't think it even moved the bar forward at the slightest on driving waste management up the hierarchy. So there's five major policy reforms all been consulted on in the last six months. And that's why I've got this panel here because we wanna hear what they think about some of these initiatives. Next slide, please. And then I, I'm always a big fan of collaboration, which is why you have a panel of experts, but I'm, I wanna leave this one with the audience. I've used this one before. This is, this is you know, serious, serious uh, you know, in, intelligence, if you like, but just for packaging, top bar, if we take all the packaging put on the market in 2023, all the target packaging that we're thinking about recycling, if we assume that 90% of the people recycle that packaging, and let's assume they do it 90% right, i.e. accuracy, because you know there's always a bit of uncertainty, isn't there? And they get it 90% of the time correct, i.e. they might be on holiday one week, they, you know, they might be working away, whatever it is. That means 73% of the available material might get to me as a collector, as a, as, as a handler. Now, let's assume my systems are 90% efficient, which is pretty good. They might get up to 95. And let's assume that when we reprocess and we take out the glues and the wraps and all the other bits and bobs, we've got 90% efficiency. That means the recycling rate is 59%. Well, that's short of the 70% target we've already set ourselves. So we need a system that's 92% efficient at those five levels. That's why we're at 45% recycling rate in England currently, because the efficiency levels are huge and that's why i think the policy agenda is interesting are we going to drive enough efficiency at each of those levels to make the magic 70 percent question for the panel next final slide or is that my final slide Spencer? 
there we go. My interesting point. So I'm going to drop these on the uh, on the audience. These are things for you to think about over the course of the next 50 minutes. What are the modulated fees that are going to drive extended producer responsibility? We don't know what they are yet, yet we're being asked to vote on systems and governance and protocols. Is there going to be consistent labelling? Well, we hope so, but it's not guaranteed. Um, what about household-like business waste streams? They're on different timescales with different targets. I'm just not sure how I should respond when I'm at home or at work. I just think we need greater consistency. Governance structures are still up in the air. What's the role of compliance schemes? I don't know. Can we delay DRS? Something that a few of us have asked government recently. Do we need all of these policy reforms happening at the same time, or is that too much complexity? And with too much complexity comes too much risk. I don't know whether political risk outweighs operational risk. Flexible packaging start date. We don't know when the flexibles may or may not start. We're being consulted on that at the moment. I would suggest sooner rather than later. The more that we can move things forward quickly, the better, I think, so we can learn some lessons. And how long is a transition period? Because the government aren't clear on this. Is it two years, five years, seven years, or maybe it's longer? The consultation documents all have slightly different transition periods for different materials and different circumstances. I think it's very difficult to predict what 2030 will look like, but I think that's the task ahead of us. So there's the slides done. Let's have a go. So where are we going to go first? I think we should get Yarno to step up. Yarno is representing local government today. How are you, Yarno? I'm very well, um, Adam. Um, yeah, glad to uh, glad to be uh, here in this uh, on this expert panel. Um, yeah, so how how am I feeling after these uh, after this turbulent period of consultations, pandemics, Euro Euro cups, trashed West Ends, flooding, um, you name it. We've had it all this year. And to be honest, yeah, I'm I'm, I'm a bit tired. I could do with a holiday. Not that a holiday is is sort of an easy thing to do, but. I think with regards to the, the, the resources and waste strategy consultations, yes, as a local authority sector, we very much welcome change because what we're currently doing is just not sustainable financially, environmentally, it's haphazard, it's defragmented, you, you know, all the all the drawbacks. Well, I do think what, what we missed the trick, as you say, waste reduction and waste prevention. It's simply what, you know, what the resources and waste strategy is put in place. Yes, circular economy, great, but we're still pumping huge amounts of material around and rather than reducing how much we consume in the first place and i know that might not be everyone's everyone's priority but you know with regards to resource efficiency and making sure that we still got something tomorrow and the day after we have to address that what i'm also missing in resources and waste strategy at the moment is defining clear links to other policies for example you know and is not exhaustive carbon energy resource security etc and it also doesn't do a lot about addressing the concerns within the local authority sector as well as the packaging sector the waste management sector the retailers etc um what is being done about the doubts we have and the concerns and you know is all the data that underpins resources and waste strategy that good do we really want to put our lives that that's the correct data are we now making flawed decisions based on data sets that that have got flaws in them, basically. Um, are we, due to Brexit, now no longer aligned with what the EU is doing? I'm very much aware that you know the UK is doing pretty well on some of the uh, initiatives, such as uh, taxation of plastics, etc. And you, you, the EU is sort of following us there. There are also numerous topics where we're trailing behind in the UK, and is that just going to get worse and worse? And are we focusing on the right topics? To be ahead on in, in the UK. So that's sort of my 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 thoughts in a nutshell um, on that, Adam. Thanks, Yana. So you, you raised some really interesting points to get us started. How good's the data? Because we're we're you know we're going to put two billion pounds into the system, but we don't quite know how good the current system is. Um, you raise a really interesting point about the the competing interests of other of other policy areas as well. I mean, I I think how you put the resource and waste sector at the heart of decarbonisation, I think is a great question I'd like to raise at COP, if only COP would actually look at resource efficiency and circular economy, because it's not on the agenda yet, is it? Um, so I think you're right, getting government to align those, those policy initiatives is critical, otherwise you get the silo mentality that I think has always held us back. Great, let's go down the line. So we've now got Robert Thompson, uh, brand retailer, yeah, I mean, you're in the mix with this packaging stuff, mate. How are you feeling? Um, well, yeah, I work for a co-op, so uh, I'm a packaging technologist. I work in the ethics sustainability policy team at the co-op. Um, I feel optimistic um, about the last round of consultations. Um, I think that the policy proposals of EPR, DRS, 
consistency of collection and the plastics tax combined do have the potential to revolutionise the way that we create and manage waste in this country. Um, I feel that sometimes there's an overemphasis on packaging materials made of plastics, though, uh, when we should be looking, as Jana was saying, about the total environmental impact of all materials, both in terms of the weight of the waste and also in terms of their carbon equivalent. Uh, and I think that there's a tendency to focus on existing infrastructures. So how can we collect and recycle more materials rather than looking at how we can improve on those materials or even avoid their use in the first place. Uh, some highlights um, from the consultations for me were around the planned modulation of fees under EPR, according to how recyclable a material is. So for the past five years, I've been working on making all of our own brand packaging recyclable uh, by removing pigments, multi-layer trays, ensuring plastic to paper ratios are in line with CPI guidance, eliminating hard to recycle polymers like PVC and expanded polystyrene. And that's all come at a cost. So modulating the fees that relate to that will start to level the playing field out. Um, I think it's right that brand owners should be the point of compliance um, because they're the ones that have the most power over the material specifications. I understand my own brand packaging, but I've got very little information about the branded products that we sell. Uh, I'm also supportive of the suggested universal collection of pot stubs and trays, and as you were saying, plastic bags and wrapping, as well as food waste. Um, what concerns do I have? Uh, there would be around the imposition of the plastics tax, regardless of whether a material can currently legally include 30% recycled content with regards to food contact legislation. Uh, this has already started to drive producers out of, for example, polypropylene pots into RPET which is just going to put more pressure on the already stretched RPET market. It's going to lead producers to incur new tooling costs and potentially increase the weight of packaging placed on the market. So I think that we need the recycling capacity to be there before we start to tax people for not using it. Um, I'm concerned that there's no guarantee that the money raised from taxes and levies are going to be used to develop domestic recycling infrastructure. Uh, and I think that this should be a requirement of the scheme administrator. Um, I'm concerned that there's an option uh, being considered that would allow producers to come up with their own recycling label because that could completely undermine all the great work that OPRL have done over recent decades. Um, I suppose for, for most of the retail sector, sector, the big concern is going to be around the financial impact of some of these measures, particularly for us, the upfront costs of setting up a DRS across 2,700 stores and the uncertainty around the categories for modulated fees, because until we have these costs and categories confirmed, we're not able to start updating our data systems and accruing the costs. Um, I'm also concerned that government might ask producers to set up the scheme administrator, which is a little bit like asking the fox to guard the hen house in my view. Um, I'm concerned about the lack of phasing of the measures, as you were saying, Adam, we could potentially be hit by DRS, EPR and the plastics tax all at the same time, uh, as well as having to cover existing PRN costs for the last quarter of next year. Uh, so in my view, it'd be better to phase those measures in sequentially and have a clean break from PRNs prior to EPR coming into force. Um, I would question some of the recycling targets that are proposed. Um, I think if we're going to spend £2.7 billion on this stuff, then we should be aiming to re for high recycling targets. In terms of DRS, uh, I'm concerned that the British glass industry has made it clear they don't want or need a DRS for glass to maintain high recycling rates. Uh, so I'm concerned that that could damage recycling of glass and potentially increase emissions if people have to start bringing glass back to store where previously they would have recycled it at curbside. Yeah and space in store and manual handling risks for colleagues uh, are further concerns to consider with glass. Um, probably a, one of the biggest concerns that I've got around DRS, DRS is around the lack of a joined up approach across the four nations. Um, I think to have a Scottish system collecting different materials to England and from a different date will create a huge administrative burden for us and a potential for fraud if the English barcode is redeemable in Scotland. So we would encourage all the four nations to work together to create a DRS that increases recycling rates and reduces pollution. Um, so they're kind of my highlights and, and concerns around
the last round of consultations. Thanks, Robert. Some highlights and some lowlights. Uh, your, your, your positivity is, is noted. And um, I, 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 mean, I think you're right. There's a lot of really good stuff in these documents. And, and it might be that we end up focusing on on some of the issues as we see them. But I think there's the issues. If we don't get them right going forward, all the other good stuff might get undermined by, by us failing to just you know get those systems to click. Um, I think you, you raised some really valid points about DRS as well. I mean, I can't understand why we can't have one system. I, I, I know there's a politics uh, to, to be overcome, but even politicians have to understand that, you know, the Scottish market surely isn't big enough to dictate what happens in the UK market, even if they think they, they can. So we'll, we'll come back to that one, no doubt. Um, last but not least, Sarah Jane Willison, how are you? I'm good, thank you. Yes. Who are you representing today? What, what, what part of the value chain? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> this is a good point. So I thought I'd make some comments about um, my personal reflections as a consultant working for different clients, but also perhaps with a wider sector CIWM hat on, uh, but really just based on um, the work that we've been doing together recently around skills for the future and how this links into that. So I'll start probably with my own personal gripes. Um, <laughs> when I was... I was making a little list of um, how I felt about this. And unfortunately, I think the gripes and the grumbles sort of um, were more than the positive side of things. However, you know, you wait, you wait ages for a bus and then five come along at once and you don't know which one to get on. And it's, yeah. <laughs> so I think there was an overriding feeling of um, happiness that, you know, there was so much activity, but also frustration. Um, I've been doing a lot of uh, strategy work for municipalities, for local authorities recently, happening at the same time as all of these consultations coming down the line. And actually that the amount of uncertainty about what would be happening, what it's going to cost, when it would kick in, is just the overriding emotion, really. I mean, it's great that we've got all of this coming down the line, but it, it just feels it feels too uncertain still, I think, to, to make investments on, to plan for the future, and for, particularly for local authorities to understand what sort of funding, you know, is, is they have to play with, so what investment they can make in, in services. I think there's also a little bit of frustration about that we're not going far enough, fast enough, so part of my work has been recently has been working with Root, which is a packaging consultancy. I've been doing a lot of horizon scanning around um, Europe, the US, around what sort of policies they're bringing in, how far they're going, particularly for Europe. You know, there's a lot of countries that are, are, are shooting far ahead of us, which I found quite frustrating that we're just formulating this policy at the moment. We really have an opportunity here to, to take a an additional step forward I think so that's another little frustration um labeling yeah that's I completely support a sort of a UK labeling system OPRL but again working for some of the international brands that I've been working with recently there's massive frustration there that actually you know so many different countries have their own approach to labeling products through identifying, you know, what can and cannot be recycled. So I can see a, a bigger picture there, um, which then links me to, I suppose, with my CIWM or sector hat on. One of the things I think that I observed through working with different people through these consultations is that actually we, we often sit in our own little silos. So we understand perfectly our own little space how these policies are going to impact us in the future, but it's very difficult often to, you know, if you're a local authority officer, to potentially step back and see what challenges the brands have and why they approach things in certain ways. And then for brands to see, you know, we're putting this amazing uh, product on the market, it's got this packaging, but why can't it be recycled? What, you know, what, what's stopping it being recycled? So to understand you know, the value chain end to end is gonna be a really important skill for the future. And I think you picked it up initially about collaboration. 
um, just thinking systemically about how these policies fit together, but how we as individuals working in the sector, you know, how we can draw from the experiences of other and how we can amplify the effect of these policies going forward. So all really important skills for the future that have been outlined in your presidential report, which I know you're, you're, you're taking forward in anger at the moment. So I am. Yeah. I am. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and you're right, if you, if you read any of these consultation documents or you read the government's, or at least the English government's before I get up, you know, upset yeah. somebody north mm -hmm. or, or, or west of the borders, um, the strategy, they, they say nothing about skills. They, they don't reference yeah. the huge change or transition. I mean, they talk about transitioning, but they talk about that as a time frame. They don't talk about that in the fact that you're suddenly going to need you know, 100,000 repair specialists, you're going to need yeah. another 100,000 refuse collectors who are now behavioural change specialists and material quality uh, bastions and guardians. I mean, it, it just doesn't happen overnight, does it? Yeah. Um, thanks for that. That's fantastic. Yeah. Um, right. We've got loads of good questions coming in, but I'm going to ask a poll question first. So, Sweater, if we can get the audience to vote, please. We'll just, we just want to see where you are, audience. So we've, I've talked to you about these big five consultations. You've heard you know, some of the initial feedback, but I'm interested in whether or not you've read them and, and, and responded to them. So have you read none? Tick the first box. Have you read one of them? Have you read some of them and responded to at least one of them? Have you read all of them and responded to two or more? Or have you been really sad and read and responded to all of them um, because it's your day job or just because you're interested? Um, while you're voting... Um, yeah, I know you've read them all and responded to them all because you've got another hat outside of Westminster, haven't you? You're Northern. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just having flashbacks of all the all the late nights and all the sacrificed weekends going through sometimes bone dry consultation material and trying to figure out how they all uh, how they all work together. So yes, um, through the National Association of Waste Disposal Officers, uh, we have responded to all the consultations, the waste prevention plan, as well as a number of secondary consultations that came out around uh, bio waste, uh, site waste permitting, competencies, etc. So there's been a busy period for for consultations, and yes, of course, you know, for for my line of work uh, at, at the City Council, I also need to be aware of what's you know thundering down the tracks ahead um, towards us. So there's some interesting feedback. So 47% have read some and responded to one or more. Uh, and 22% are, are with you and me, Yano. You've read and responded to them all because, you know, we, we, you got to get your voice heard. So that's a nice mix. And actually, most of the audience are clearly engaged in some elements of this. And the 22% at the top are clearly here to learn. So don't worry, we can, we can tell them the highlights and the lowlights now, can't we? So thanks very much for that audience. That was good. Um, loads of questions coming in. Uh, Sarah Jane, you've, you've, you've really touched the nerve with siloism. Uh, and collaboration, mm. so uh, so spot on there. Um, most of the questions are about the lack of waste prevention in any of the debate. And even when you had a document about waste prevention, that it lacks waste prevention. So, I mean, maybe I'll ask uh, each of you what your thoughts are on the waste prevention plan specifically. I mean, is government ignoring it because it's too hard? Is government too focused on getting the system right and therefore EPR, DRS, consistent collections is the system you can manage? Or is it something else? Uh, what do you reckon, it, Sarah Jane? Uh, I think it's too hard. Um, it, the problem with waste prevention is that for many people, it's quite intangible. Um, you know, recycling, there's an activity there, isn't there? You're picking something up, you're putting it somewhere else, it then goes on to get reprocessed, et cetera. But it, it struck me, it's a little bit like, um, I saw one of the government press conferences recently on uh, COVID and actually how many COVID deaths have been avoided through the vaccination programme. And again, it's a really difficult concept to, to get hold of, this sort of prevention activity. So I, I think it's just a really difficult space to, to explain. But also, there's also that feeling of um, loss actually if you're preventing something it, it, it always seems a little bit like you're 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 not you're not able to buy something there's that sort of yeah. um negative connotation there so yeah i think it's in the too difficult space and, and politically robert mm -hmm. you know talking about not producing this stuff in the first place suggests a bit like you don't want people to consume which clearly isn't a great message politically but also isn't a great message for for businesses up and down the country i mean 
Uh, do, do you think the government are doing enough on waste prevention or, or actually it, it is too difficult and you'd rather they steered away from it, fix recycling first? Well, I think it's difficult, but I think there's also a problem around data, as we were talking about earlier. If you look at food waste, for example, how do you work out what percentage is avoidable food waste versus unavoidable food waste? Um, I think that retailer take back of we is going to be very complicated if we, need, you know, in small convenience stores, if we need to take start taking back we, that's going to be really difficult. Um, there should be a broad solution to be applied on things like single use bags, which are going to support food waste collections. So there's lots of little in individual interplaying parts, uh, which, which is what makes it so difficult. Thank you. Right. Let's move on. Let's talk about composition change, because I think a lot of these policy proposals are aimed at, you know, eco modulation, eco design, changing the, the look and feel of packaging that's ultimately going to flow through the system. We're going to be handling different stuff. We're going to have to change our infrastructure because the MRF won't sort seven items like it used to. It'll only have three or something. You're going to keep certain materials separate because you need the quality to go around the, 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 the circular loop. So they won't go in the same facility as others. I mean, there's, there's so much change coming. What, what do we think about the short term implications? You know, what, what, what compositional changes are you expecting or have you been modeling? It's, it's interesting because if you if you look at like what was in our waste in the 60s and 70s, a lot of it was sort of fiber based. A lot of stuff came in cardboard boxes or, or paper wrappings. Then you sort of you get the you know, plastics have been around since the 1940s. It's always been in the waste stream to an extent, but it just got more and more as certain things were, you know, rather than packaged in, in a can, it now goes in a, in a plastic tub, etc. cetera. And, and I think it's a natural development that packaging materials change as our tastes change, because sometimes, you know, when I'm in the shop and I can get something in a nice looking metal packaging, I'll choose that over, you know, tatty cardboard box. Like, why, why would I do that? Of course, yeah, I know it can be recycled, but it, it tastes change, consumer tastes change. And with that, the waste we generate, and also we're living our lives differently now, you know, we're, we're many home based now. So we're using different packaging and perhaps we're not buying all these like horrible sandwiches at pret that are wrapped in all these like allegedly recyclable materials, but we all know them. Other not. brands are available, you know, unless yeah, you yeah, want sorry, to Pret. Yeah, 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 I've, yeah, yeah, I don't, I don't know if there's someone from Pret on the, on, on the line, but yeah, I've always got a bit of beef with Pret. Um, so <laughs> Um, yeah, it, it's those lifestyle changes. And, and yes, our waste composition will change. And will we see more plastic? Perhaps for some um, categories, maybe some other categories of products will move on to different types of uh, uh, products. You know, you, you're seeing an advent of, of these paper bottles now. Is that going to be prevented in our waste stream? Some some paper mills can take them, some can't. Um, how will we sort that out? Where where you know there's a solution for any waste type, but where is it going? At what price? Will it be commercially viable? And will it operationally be possible? And and I think you know those packaging changes will keep on changing. And you know you're seeing things now like you know when I used to buy an iPhone, it can come come with like foam and polystyrene and everything. Now it's just paper, and and those changes will will keep accelerating, and and that will change what we what we collect we'll always have elements that will always be there yeah of course they've always been in the waste but the packaging stream especially will, will change oh thank you uh, robert maybe following on for compositional change and if you've got a, an answer to that by all means share that as well but 30 percent recycled content a few people are asking questions about is that good is it bad how does that compare with other countries is 50 percent doable when, when does when does plastic content start to get to, you know, a point where you can't have any more recycled content for fear of it losing its, uh, you know, it, 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 its core, uh, it, you know, it, 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 its core components, if you like. Have you got thoughts on, on any of that? Yeah, well, it depends on the materials is my view. Um, so, you know, in the past we've used seven core types of, of polymers. Um, those are narrowing down. So I think the composition of plastics is going to be changing. We're going to see a lot more mono material. Uh, we're going to be seeing less polypropylene uh, until such time that you can legally incorporate 30% recycled content into food contact polypropylene. Uh, we're going to see a reduction in plastics. I believe most retailers have got a, a plastic reduction target for us. It's 15% um, by the end of next year. 
which is one of the uh, less ambitious targets, let's say, in terms of plastics reduction. Um, and I think we're going to see an increase in paper. Um, we've already seen uh, a kind of crunch on availability of paper coming from Scandinavian mills. Um, so I think there's going to be more paper, less plastic. Glass will probably stay around the same. Steel and aluminium probably as well. Um, I think what you're going to see outside of packaging is some changes to things like nappies. So, um, you know, until we decide whether composting, recycling, incineration, landfill is the preferred option for, for nappies, um, we don't know which route that's going to take, but for things like nappies, which it can be disposed of through um through water courses you know and, and other things like cotton buds um wet wipes etc we're going to see a change in the composition of those materials probably towards more um biodegradable type materials is there um is, is the anti-plastic campaign let's call it which which is has been prevalent for the last what maybe three or four years and clearly had an influence on some of the policy thinking that, that eventually came out for consultation are we the move away from plastic is that a going to create us another problem because we're moving into other materials where it makes even less sense i do worry about moving from water plastic bottles into aluminium cans i just can't see why we need more bulk site in the world um, to be dug up to create aluminium i'm just not sure about that but the other question that's being raised a lot is, is bioplastics you know are we going to get into degradables and compostables and is that causing the waste industry more problems in the future or not so let's let, i'll give you all a, a moment to think about that and sarah jane do you want to go first pick up bioplastics or or material substitution so some of the brands that i've been speaking to recently are definitely focusing more on fiber than plastics although you know a conversation that i had this morning actually was quite interesting in that there's a lot more focus on chemical recycling mm -hmm. uh, now whether this is you know the panacea for what we need in the future definitely around food contact there's you know there's are there are opportunities there um and I hope actually that that will reframe some of the thinking around plastics, because I do think it's possibly shifted the wrong way. We're kind of forgetting about how great a packaging material plastic is. Um, yeah, so I, I think we are going to see different uh, shifts in the competition around fibre and plastics, definitely. But again, it's... it's there's this real tension at the moment between policy coming in, investment for infrastructure, and everything is dependent on everything else. So, you know, there's a wait for investment until the policy is formed, but actually there's sort of a, you know, there's a wait for the policy until it's decided which way things are going. So it, it's a really difficult, it's a difficult space to be in at the moment. And I did one of the things I did like actually around um, around the consultations and some of the work done beforehand, so I was reading one of the sprint group documents around flexibles. Um, and one of the key points around it was actually, unless we start collecting this material and actually getting them hold of the material, that's one of the missing pieces of the puzzle because we can't, until we've got it, we can't then start to do things with it. So it's the chicken, um, chicken and egg scenario, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, and I think I've, you know, that's changed my thinking because in the past, I know when when we first started collecting pots, tubs and trays and we had all this glut of material and nothing that we could do with it, actually, you know, I, I, I think that has reframed the way I think about some of these things. So, cool. yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I know. What's, what's your thinking on some of this material substitution and, and biodegradables in particular? Mm -hmm. I, sort of with regards to the, the, the bio source of the product, I, I, I think I'd ra I, I prefer that over getting something, you know, fossil out of the ground and using that. The main problem is, is that once it goes into the waste management system, especially the organic stream, it can't be treated and and you know un unless you compost it for like up to 20 weeks yet yeah, might break down the majority of industrial facilities either take it out or it doesn't degrade i've seen this myself and you have know, the packaging producers still say oh yeah it's recyclable no yeah we'll 
technically everything is recyclable, but in reality it's not. However, if you then combust that material in, in, in an energy from waste process, the carbon is then biogenic. And if you capture that carbon, how is that all going to play out? And, you know, in landfill, nothing really degrades anyway. It does, it does generate methane. So I think, think bioplastics into landfill is probably not the way we want to go. Um, what about the impact of PFAS, you know, the, the forever chemicals? Uh, they're accumulating in our landfills. A landfill leachate becomes untreatable. They leak into water courses, et cetera. Can we, you know, how is that addressed through, through bioplastics? I'm, I'm sort of, the, you know, a major concern for me is, is PFAS. Um, yeah, in essence, I support bio-based uh, because of the, the, the bio source it comes from. The waste treatment option of those materials, I'm extremely hesitant about. Good point. And, and, and Robert, from your perspective, I mean, are you looking at bios as, a, as, a, as an option? And, and if so, how does the supply chain work with that? I mean, I, I know, you know, Carp have done a lot of work with the waste management system generally near them with their bio bags, for example, to ensure that there is a, there is a mechanism for them to be handled. Well, our policy is we, we, we don't use that for primary packaging, uh, or, well, for, well, for any packaging, apart from things that we know end up in food waste collections. So we, we use PLA and tea bags. Uh, we use um, bio labels on fruit because we know that people peel bananas with the, with the label attached and put that in the food waste collection. Uh, and from this year, we're starting to only sell um, reusable bags and compostable bags certified to EM13432. Um, so our view is that with um, universal food waste coming in with consistency of collection, um, that offers a convenient route for people to reu reuse a single use bag if they've forgotten their reusable bag as a food waste caddy liner. Um, so, yeah, th those are the three instances where we allow compostables at the moment, but otherwise um, our, our policy is that all co-op brand packaging is, is mechanically recyclable. Um, I think that chemical recycling has been talked about a lot as a panacea, um, but really when you drill down into it, the, the substrates that they want uh, are the same as what the mechanical recyclers want. Um, so I think we can deliver a lot of what we need to under this strategy through mechanical recycling. The problem is that we haven't got enough infrastructure domestically. Yep. So I think that the monies that are raised through EPR should help to contribute to growing domestic recycling infrastructure. Uh, I think you make a really good point and you've made it twice now about UK infrastructure. I think you're absolutely right. We, we, we're we missing that kind of element in the plan at the moment. So thanks for that. Um, Right. I mean, there's loads of questions about chemical recycling. All I'm going to say is Be Waste Wise has run a session on chemical recycling once before. And sweater, we probably need to run another one based on the amount of questions coming in. Um, so we're going to park some of those. I want to ask another poll question of the audience now, please. Um, give the uh, panel a little break. Um, so if we flip this one up, it's, uh, it relates to a point that Sarah Jane's made a couple of times now about policy uncertainty. Um, so if you'd like to vote audience, we'd just like to give the, uh, the panelists there. Is the current policy uncertainty in the UK, but if you're somewhere else, um, just, just, just go with it, um, slowing down your progress on. Now tick the one that probably is most appropriate. Is it slowing down your local policy strategy or procurement? Is it slowing down changes that you were planning in service or any innovations in service? Is it slowing down in infrastructure investment? Uh, Sarah Jane mentioned that um, up front. Is it, is it uh, slowing down data monitoring or management system change or, or implementation? Or maybe it's slowing down your recruitment and your training because you don't know what you're recruiting or training for because the landscape is moving. So while you're thinking about that, um, got a couple of other points probably worth raising. Um, uh, Robert, I mean, life cycle assessment, I, I assume as a you know, packaging technologist, material specialist, you're doing this all the time to work out what's the right material for, for your packaging formats going forward? Um, well, it, you would think so, but it's actually something we've only just recently started to do. Um, so we've, we've set a target to get to net zero by 2040 and to reduce our scope three emissions by 11% by 2025 compared to 2016. Um, but it's only this year that we've actually started to measure the impact of individual materials. So what I need to do now is look at all the things that I've changed over the last five years and try to work that out in terms of CO2 equivalent. So we, you know, we've been removing black plastic to make things more recyclable. We've been increasing the recycled content in our packaging. So 
in plastics, for example, now we've got about 33% uh, average recycled content. Uh, tea bottles for drinks this year will have percent recycled. So I need going back and working out in terms of carbon uh, equivalent. Um, but what I always say with packaging materials is the answer is always it depends. There is no simple uh, answer <laughs> to the question of carbon uh, in packaging because if you look at plastics, different polymer types have different carbon impacts. Your carbon impact can change depending on where your product is manufactured, uh, how it's transported, uh, how far is it being shipped, what's the end of life disposal route, how much dead space, head space have you got on your pallet, uh, what's the impact on food waste, and that's that's the big one, the impact on food waste. Um, if you if you move out of plastic into paper and you lose a day's shelf life, the impact of food waste on carbon impact compared to packaging is, is huge. We know that for co-op brand, about 8% of our carbon footprint comes from packaging, whereas over a third comes from the ingredients in the products. So reducing food waste, uh, it has a massive impact on carbon. And I think we'd all support more life cycle type analysis being important from that, that holistic policy perspective, because Sarah Jane talked about silos and being, you know, a major headache. Actually, life cycle thinking kind of stops the silos, doesn't it, Sarah Jane? Because in theory, you can't do an, an assessment of how how carbon efficient is my waste management, because my waste management is helping the residue from the production system, which has a huge carbon footprint if I don't deal with it. So you've got to see it in that in its holistic nature, haven't you? I think you need to remember about system boundaries. So that's the only uh, <laughs> point. So it's where you draw the boundary for your life cycle assessment. But, you know, lies, damn lies and statistics. So uh, you can pick your boundary wherever, unfortunately. Thank you. Sweat Sweaters put the, uh, uh, the previous chemical recycling webinar link in the chat, everybody. So grab a coffee and, and you can listen back and, and, and hopefully we can answer some of your questions. Loads more good questions. Uh, I'm conscious of time. We're going to have to start wrapping up in a minute. Um, let's have a quick question about um, enforcement or behavior change, um, stick or carrot. So, Jano, are, are, we, are, we make, are we making it too easy for people just to not do the right thing? And I, when I say people, I, I don't just mean consumers, I mean businesses as well. And while he's on mute, <laughs> go on, Sarah Jane, you can have a go. So I start. Um, yeah, I, I, we are missing, um, I think for residents in particular, we're missing that sort of, that reflection on where a resident, an individual thinks about the product that they're buying. So, you know, when, when we're talking about We've talked a lot about responsible consumerism recently and really thinking about what you're purchasing. But a lot of people are quite detached. So they, you know, recycling is OK. I recycle everything. Well, that, that's fine. But actually, you're still buying the stuff in the first place. You know, you're not thinking about waste prevention and you're not thinking about sustainable choices if you do have to purchase something. So. I've seen a lot of um, carbon plans recently talking about sustainable consumption, which is a little bit of an oxymoron, to be honest, but it, it's about getting residents to really think about, actually, you know, if you're buying something, you're making the choice around that product and whether you are contributing, you know, your environmental choices are around consumption very long way around to talk about that but yeah uh, good point good point uh, <laughs> I, I, you, there's some really interesting stuff in there and there's so many questions coming in now I'll, I'll, i've got a headache um <laughs> let, let's let, let, let let's let, I, paul vanston ink pen always ask good questions i'm gonna i'm gonna ask one of his so the much anticipated resourcing the future conference at ciwm esa ink pen the list goes on all the organizations collaborating i think Nord nordo or adept and others in the middle of October, two days face to face as well. Well, wow, it's going to be a real, real shock to the system. But what do the panelists want to hear at a conference in terms of this huge policy portfolio? What, what can we put on there that's going to be really 
really top draw, which is going to, you know, it's, it's going to move the agenda forward. So let's start with you, Yano. What, what would you want, at a, a, you know, at a big industry, multi-sectoral event that's going to help move the, the, the policy agenda forward? Wow, where, where do we start, Adam? Um, you know, the, the, the wish list will be huge, but where do we can actually get all of those? That, that remains to be seen, but I think at, at least sort of come to an agreed positions between sectors of, yeah, this is where we want to move towards to, and then use that sort of, you know, as, as a structure to, to build up on. Um, I, I think you know we're not we're not going to resolve all the world all, all the all the nation's problems at that conference, but I'd at least sort of agree on a direction we are going, and how we potentially get there, and then work the rest out as and when required. Um, and you know, at, at the moment, I'm, I'm I'm not entirely sure whether everyone in 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 the in the different sectors is moving the same direction, and it seems some people are going off in one direction and. You know, there's all these deviations and different opinions, but at least can we sort out the headlines at a really high level as to where we want to go to collectively and, and what makes sense and what doesn't. I like that. Co collective direction of travel, uh, possibly with a timetable. Um, yeah. Robert, as somebody that's not in that sector, but is clearly an important part of this bigger agenda, what would you like to see on a resources and waste conference that's got policy at the heart of the debate? How, 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 how do we make it work? for you and your peers? Um, uh, for me, uh, again, it's about um, consistency. So how do we link up the value chain so that everybody's working towards the same goals? Um, you know, if one part of the sector is working on compostables and the other part is working on recyclables, they're not compatible. Yep. So we need to try and work out as a whole value chain, how do we as producers work out what's the best materials to use that the local authorities can sort and that have a value to the recyclers and hand then how do we get that material back into our packaging so it's about joining up the whole value chain for me good man good man and then finally sarah jane apart from saying skills um <laughs> what, what 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 do you fancy on that agenda that, that i'm obvious i say um i think just to echo the same to be honest it's got to be around collaboration you know it's got to be sort of the the operations manager at the MERF saying actually this packaging works for me, this packaging doesn't work for me, and these are the reasons why to the uh, to the brand, to the manufacturer, to, you know, it's getting these insights from each part of the chain. So, yeah. Good. Right. We've got one more poll to go, Sweater, mm -hmm. and then I'm going to then I'm gonna wrap up with one big question. So uh, those of you that voted in the last poll, thank you very much. It looked like we were we were slowing progress on all fronts, and, and it looked like slowing it on the on the decision making more than the investment, but the investment comes later as Sarah Jane alluded to. So here we go. How confident are you, audience? Because of course our uh, panelists can't vote, um, that the policy reforms as outlined will deliver as expected. So we know what the targets are. Will these five sets of policy reform deliver? Yes, I'm very confident. Yes, I'm confident. No, I'm not confident. And no, they definitely won't deliver. Take your pick now. And whilst they're doing that, here you go, three panellists. This is the last question. Yes, it's a tricky question, I know. Um, sorry, there's people in the audience emailing me direct. Um, huge policy reforms. Are they going to deliver us a circular economy? Which is a different question to the one I've asked the audience. Sarah Jane, are these five sets of policy reform getting us closer to a circular economy or not? A small step closer. Um, I think the world is changing so rapidly at the moment but that by the time all of this is bedded in, we'll have new challenges to, to do. So I think definitely in the right direction, but not as far or as fast as I would hope. Okay, Yano. It, it depends a lot on, okay, you, you can say a lot as, as a government, okay, we're going to do this, and we're going to do that, but but is there actually the drive, the financing and the will to to push it forward? Or is it just sort of, you know, a tick box of like, oh, yeah, we've done that, but nothing actually happens of it. And, you know, the UK waste policy was famous for that in the past. Um, so is actually anything going to change? I think certain things will change. Is everything going to change? Maybe, you know, we will have to review certain things midway. And, you know, as things like climate change become so prevalent, 
perhaps we have to make some really drastic decisions that are then going to impact on what the, you know is in the resources and waste strategy for example um it's very difficult to say a lot of it for local authorities depends on funding and we're, we're not rich as local authorities you know our, our budgets are, have evaporated over the last couple of years austerity is not over it's still continuing there's authorities going bankrupt uh unprecedented funding challenges regarding covid how are we going to pay for all this extra stuff? Yeah, we can do it. If you fund us properly, we can do anything you want or anything that's needed. But, you know, if the government is not, you know, putting up and saying, OK, yeah, fine, we're going to, you know, commit to that. Yeah, of course, the whole thing is going to break down. If you don't make, spend maintenance on your car, yeah, it's going to break down. Of course, so that, the same will happen with the local authority systems. Thank you, Jano. Mr. Pragmatic. Uh, Robert, you were probably the most, most uh, confident at the beginning of the session. Uh, so how, how are you feeling, these five delivering on their policy objectives? Um, well, I think I'm optimistic about the direction of travel, but we need to build the road. Um, so I, I think the, the intentions that are in the policy reforms uh, are, are good, um, but there are some specifics uh, that need to be ironed out in terms of how, how do we deliver those things. So I would say that I'm probably confident rather than very confident. Okay. Whereas the audience were not confident. So we haven't done a good job of it, of, of selling them the vision. 67% they're not confident. 27% were confident. Thank you very much, audience, for voting and taking part. Questions have been awesome. Listen, we are absolutely in the last two minutes. Um, too many other good questions to ask, but I'm going to throw a, a quick fire around in because it's my prerogative. Um, so you can only answer this in one sentence and I don't want like long breaths or anything. So Sarah Jane, um, will reuse and refill make a significant difference in the next five years? Hopefully, hopefully probably not. Just, <laughs> leave it with hopefully. <laughs> okay, cool. Jarno, um, is the planning system ready for all of this new infrastructure that's needed? Certain cases, in other cases, it's not. It, 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 re, it really depends. Um, just an example, uh, Corey Energy spent, I don't know, close to over a decade battling Ken and the, the GLA on, on the Belvedere Energy from Waste Facility. The second one got through relatively easy and it's being built now. It's the same for other waste management um, waste management uh, facilities. Yeah, there is a need. And I don't think the planning system always recognises what's need that needed. There's, there's a disconnect. And, you know, some authorities have had disasters with, with their procurements. Adam, you'll, you'll be aware of it. Like, you know, some of the Suez projects um, and others get through relatively easy and, and, and it really varies and it, it, it depends on, on who's dealing with it and then you know does the Secretary of State get involved and turn something down because there is interest behind the scenes that we're not aware of. Um, I definitely think that the, the planning system needs needs looking at and if we want to manage more of our resources in the UK and actually do something with it yeah the stuff needs to be built but also are we going to build on the right scale why are we doing like things like building two facilities of the same type in an area by operated by different operators rather than like build one big one why are we doing that why are we making the system inefficient and yeah the, the planning system has got a large role to play i, I wish i'd never asked you about planning um because that was a very long sentence mate but nonetheless very Great. good quality uh, which which relates back to robert's point about building uk infrastructure because he wants big uk markets he wants uk material so you two need to get together and solve that one i'm interested you, you, i think you were promoting a socialist state there by the way you know we will build x here but we'll We'll, we'll take that sweater. We need a session on planning and, and making the system deliverable on a, on a circular economy. Robert, final question for you, because I'm, I'm running out of time now. Is the packaging sector closer to the waste and resource management sector today than it ever has been? Uh, yes, I would say so. Um, so things like the plastics packed, um, Prior to that, all the wrap work that was done with the packaging sector generally, uh, so the rationalisation of packaging working group, which led to the Plastics Pact, OPRL, the Confederation of Paper Industries, British Glass, um, you know, the, the Metal Packaging Manufacturers Association, all of those trade bodies are all over this stuff. Um, and... Uh, I think packaging manufacturers want to do the right thing for the environment. Uh, it's seen as a, as a positive uh, 
uh, thing for their brand as well as just wanting to do the right thing for the planet. Good. And I'm going to end on that positive because you're right. I think the R2 sectors are so much closer now than they have been. And I think that's an important lesson for other material streams, Yano and Sarah J, as we move forward beyond these policy reforms and we start to look at other materials. Listen, panel, you've been awesome. So much interesting detail. We could have run another four sessions. You sweater, we probably will have to. We'll talk about that later. Uh, audience, thanks very much for giving up your time. Hopefully you didn't get indigestion whilst you were munching on your on your sandwiches um, and back to sweater it's been a pleasure by the way thanks very much for uh, letting me host take care sweater thank you adam thanks a lot to all the panelists and thank you to the audience this is just an information for the audience in case you're interested uh, on topics around latin america we have a panel tomorrow which focuses on el salvador and ecuador so please uh, head to our website and you can register there with respect to this webinar it's going to be up on our website in a couple of weeks but since you've registered you will have access to it right from now. All right. Bye-bye. Have a good day. Take care. Goodbye.